This is part four, the finale of our latest climate mini-series. In parts one through three, we hit the upper atmosphere, major climate cycles, and the lower atmosphere. The natural next question is to ask how much the sun controls global warming. How much are we to blame? Well, for this, we always play devil's advocate at the outset, so we'll begin with the official numbers used these days for human blame in global warming. And what a shocker, it's 100%. They believe that our carbon pollution is responsible for everything. Now this paper did not use the solar particle forcing, did not factor in Earth's weakening magnetic field, the lower atmosphere connections and rapid forcing, etc. Same with every climate paper to ever make human global warming claims. And alas, this is where we will begin. Let's go ahead and start at that 100% and see how we can peck away. And we'll begin with a blast from the past. Try to keep up with our video from May where we pick apart the climate story in eight minutes. Then we'll come back to the numbers and find a titanic frustration. The collapse of the climate science you know has already been published by top researchers in top journals. Someone just needs to point out all the pieces that are already here. This may look confusing, but admit it, it's pretty. And this is the outline of the demise of climate science. We're going to run them down one by one, starting with the failures of the science. A1, failure to predict the future. At no point have the climate models accurately modeled the future. The official observed temperatures have consistently come in below the scary global warming numbers, and it's one thing to not be able to predict the future, but when your models can't predict the past, that's a problem. A2. This was the case with the recent surveys of the climate world, finding the high sensitivity in conflict with the paleoclimate data, and this is a ubiquitous feature among the climate models, the inability to even reproduce the data when we extend the timeline into the past. A3 and A4 can almost be combined as oversensitivity and heat bias to CO2 combines with the uncertainties in aerosol and cloud forcing as one of the major causes of these model failures. They trigger bias development in the oceans that becomes troubling in only six months into simulations. And recently, when half of Arctic warming was blamed on ozone loss, which is actually a third of all global warming, it told us that the heat that has been blamed on carbon all these years is a fantasy. The questions surrounding carbon have been a prominent piece of the literature the last 18 months, along with the identification and quantification of the uncertainties, which again, always seem to skew one way, heat bias. A5 is the lowering of climate sensitivity, which is not only expressly favored in the paleoclimate disagreement studies, but the lack of specific changes that would absolutely be expected if they had the models right and which are simply not being seen, further pushes towards the library of studies out in the last two years favoring a less extreme version of global warming and lower climate sensitivity to carbon. And it is not just uncertainty and heat bias that fails to predict the future or the past, but the data itself has come under major question just this year by the world's number one climate journal. You won't see this on CNN. We've seen the accusations about temperature adjustments into the past and climate gate emails about how they were going to rig the data, but the urban heat island effect at A6 adds on a major source of doubt to the realization that something else is happening in the climate. A7 is a point of discussion. Anytime someone points to studies about how global warming is going to get us all or there's a consensus in the science, those are the studies that have the bias, uncertainty, urban heat island effects, and which can't predict the future or the past. A8. Yes, folks, the changes we are seeing are going to trigger an ice age. When the water is locked as ice at the poles, the oceans are more saline and the mid-latitudes are temperate. Melting the ice at the poles affects the heat transport in the oceans and triggers rapid cooling towards ice age conditions. Not to mention those major snow and cold events that have crippled parts of Europe and more recently, Texas. Climate models fail tremendously at their foundations, and the studies saying otherwise are guilty of an A-list violation, or multiple, and at the end of the day, it's all leading to cold anyway. Section B is unappreciated forcing, the things that are really affecting the climate. Starting at B1, volcanoes. This is the volcanic aerosol cooling of the atmosphere during the time of official climate science. The problem is that this is the data from the U.S. government on volcanic cooling going back more than a millennia. That green box on the right is what I showed before, the time of official climate science, and we are not only missing the true forcing power of volcanoes when we skew the timeline, but we haven't had any major cooling effect from them in centuries. When they ask where the century of heat we just had came from, if we're cutting back the carbon blame, part of the answer is that volcanoes have been taking it easy on us, not blocking out as much light. And then you move on to B2, where you add more to the equation to make up for CO2. 
These are all the published and confirmed correlations and mechanisms of solar forcing of the atmosphere. And here is what official climate science allows into the discussion, just irradiance, which not only misses the majority of ways the sun affects us with its particle and field forcing, which is a massive blunder to anyone who can grasp the energy conversion of particles to light, that's right, and the way they do irradiance is nonsensical as well. This is our favorite recent example, the irradiance and therefore solar climate forcing in official climate models during the September 2017 solar storms, the largest in 12 years. Yes, some spectra of UV dropped, and in official climate models, it says the sun gave us less energy, but x-rays surged by a thousand, particle bombardment surged by a factor of 10,000, and folks, it was a massive energy input to our planet that showed up as negative solar forcing in official climate models. By the way, the entirety of solar forcing is organized into a climate playlist that can be found linked right below this video, where you can learn what the real effect of those solar storms were on the planet. Cosmic rays are where they fail again to appreciate the sun. Where the sun is weak, it not only gives us less energy, but it blocks out fewer cosmic rays, which trigger cloud condensation and attract dust and vapor particles to enhance the albedo cooling. When the sun is active, it blocks out those cosmic rays, in addition to giving us more energy. That makes it a double whammy of heating versus cooling that, again, is not factored into climate models. The literature from the last decade on cosmic rays and lightning has also been solidified in the last two years as well. So just to clarify, that plays into both A3 and A4 along with the volcanoes in the sun. And now get this. They not only can't predict the future or the past, they peg CO2 as the problem along with uncertainties. Low carbon sensitivity is favored and the changes that we're seeing are actually going to lead to cold. The climate has much more to do with volcanoes, the sun, and cosmic ray modulation than is allowed into climate models. And on top of all of that, the sun has had an easier road to warming the planet with our magnetic field fading. It's not just more blame for the sun, but its doorway has actually become a floodgate. And then of course, there is the mechanism in the atmosphere that makes a lot of these electrodynamic couplings work, the global electric circuit. There is no aspect of geophysics outpacing the growth of this field over the last decade, and the studies have just been waiting to pour their answers on how clouds and pressure cells are subject to manipulation electrically. Key recent ones solidify that electrical path over those currently working in climate models. They confirm and better characterize the rapid forcing like somewhere between the speed of light and 10 seconds to affect the entire world electrically. And the key aspect of the field forcing has been described now too. We waited years for this one, and now it's giving climate scientists nightmares. Here's one that won't go into print until June, but it's going to be another slam dunk for these electrical pathways, connecting them with the solar fields, the IMF, which means the global electric circuit is actually a solar system electric circuit. You can find my favorite 500 solar climate forcing papers as of 2020 in one place, spaceweathernews.com slash publications. For every one I showed in this video, there are dozens I didn't. When you enter this discussion with someone else, it's their failure to predict, their bias, their uncertainty, favoring lower sensitivity, and reality is that we're heading for an ice age. Studies saying we're in danger from heat are guilty of that bias, uncertainty, and inability to predict. They don't use solar particles or field forcing, or an appropriate treatment of volcanoes, solar irradiance, the magnetic field, or the global electric circuit. And we're back. There was a lot in there, but specifically on the point of attribution for climate change, there are a number of things that have been ignored even while being published in those major journals. Let's start with what's up top here, and frankly, the uncertainty and bias and oversensitivity can really all be lumped into this general category, causing the paleoclimate disagreement, and it's all because they give CO2 too much credit. By the way, this ozone study and the fact that Earth's weakening magnetic field is allowing greater particle destruction is not a factor considered by those 100 percenters. And so, we know right off the bat it's 100 percent minus whatever they've overestimated in CO2 oversensitivity, minus the extra ozone destruction by solar particles, allowing more ultraviolet light into the lower atmosphere. Of course, their cherry-picked natural volcanic forcing data shows but a fraction of the real variability, hiding how little albedo addition it's provided, and that also has been letting more sunlight in to heat the atmosphere. The big one, of course, is the solar particle forcing itself through the geoelectric and geomagnetic systems, with forcing so rapid it's described as near light speed, instantaneous and immediate, as we saw in Part 3. 
as we saw in the eight-minute raising, the false solar drop during flare eruptions must also be considered, and so that's two more things on the list that are official mainstream science, but which the climate world ignores. And last but not least, the weakening magnetosphere. Amplifying particle forcing and ozone destruction and access to the geomagnetic and geoelectric systems, and even working the mixing of the carbon dioxide, such that whatever amount we can attribute to CO2 is still partially driven by the sun and geomagnetic system. Now the titanic frustration. What here can we absolutely quantify? Well, this. We can see how the solar forcing inputs falsely drop due to coronal dimming in certain UV wavelengths, and it's hard to get beyond that, really. We can't really quantify just how overestimated CO2 forcing is, despite their attempts to try. And the same goes for other reductions of their 100%. We know albedo from volcanic emissions is down a few percent, but that's not the only factor in albedo. We know the solar drop is false, but not just how much the spike should go up. And while we know how weak Earth's magnetic field is, without quantifications of the previous items, we can't really translate those percentages. So, how much do these cut back that 100% human cause? How much can we blame the sun and magnetic field and volcanic quiet? I don't know. But they don't either. Not even close. The closest they come is recognizing some of these numbers, and then not including them in climate models. They know they attribute too much to CO2, but don't stray from their political line. They have not even investigated a lot of these avenues, and they have no incentive to do so. Not when they've created a $50 billion a year industry to say just what people want to hear. I'll ask you to just recall the recent story about global warming starting earlier, extending the timeline, with the message delivered to us that, oh goodness, we've been so terrible and been that way for so much longer than we thought, basically doubling the timeline we've been globally warming. But the problem is, that doesn't change what the modern warming numbers are. It just means it took much longer and much more carbon pollution to get there, which means that CO2 is not what they say, something is missing in the analysis, and their scary timelines are off by, well, at least two. Too short. I'll ask you to recall the recent story about how the Antarctic ice sheets have an amazing history. They destabilize and restabilize within only a decade. This was used to scare us into thinking, we could lose this ice at any time now. But then we remember, they tell us that modern warming is unprecedented and that it's been going on for much more than a decade. If it's so unprecedented, why hasn't the sheet destabilized yet? If their version of how it happens is right, why hasn't it happened yet? Of course, we know from part two that it's nothing even remotely close to unprecedented warming when you learn about the Dansgaard Oshker events or the Heinrich events. Folks, these things they're saying don't make any sense. The math doesn't work. They are ignoring critical aspects of the climate system. They are plainly lying in their qualitative descriptions of climate change, and they are truly not even trying to investigate. They have the data, satellites, supercomputers, scientists, and thanks to recent papers, the mechanisms and the models. But they're getting paid to prop up a paradigm that is going to be used as the death blow to the modern world and on the heels of the COVID measures to break it down so they can build back better their way, their control digital everything. Not sounding so horrible until you realize a solar flare can take it all away one day, and also in that world, try to dissent. They'll just turn off your number and poof, you're nothing. You think this is crazy? You need to wake up. This is what's coming out of their mouths. I'm not creative enough to come up with this. This is their end goal of everything that's been building the last 20 years, longer really, and most of all, since the inception of 2020. Think it will build back green? Did you miss Biden's sale of the energy fields in the Gulf of Mexico about two seconds after the climate summit this year? They're playing you. Think science and geopolitical and economic upheaval are unrelated? Think again. These worlds are colliding in obvious fashion, and while reducing pollution does make a much better environment in which to live, carbon is plant food. The real science is being hidden, and it's all in play for what they call Agenda 21, what they call the New World Order and the 30 by 30 plan. What they want in our lowered expectation and they're expecting us to own nothing and be happy. Their words, their goals, and their weapons and lies to get us there. Climate is their ace in the hole and they're getting ready to use it. Eyes open. No fear. Stay free, everyone.